Well, good morning, Hosanna. Great to have you with us again as we gather now to lift our prayers and praise and thanksgiving to God in this time of worship. Some joining us here in person in the, in the sanctuary, others joining us from homes and other places, wherever you might be. We're, we're thrilled that you can still join us by uh, way of these electronic means as we gather to lift worship, our, our prayers and praise to God on this celebration of Reformation Day. This is a day when we uh, really take some time to remember and to appreciate what Martin Luther and so many of the other reformers have done for us uh, through the, the, the difficult work of refocusing the, the church, refocusing our lives on the word of God, on the gospel of Jesus Christ, on the salvation that comes as a gift of God's grace alone, received by faith alone, and it's faith in Jesus Christ alone, and it's revealed to us through Scripture alone. So uh, this is a great time for us to really focus again on the great gift of the gospel and all that Christ has done and still does for us. And so anytime you've got a worship service that's going to take three pastors to carry it off, you know that that's going to be uh, a special day, a time to really focus on that message and uh, the gift of salvation through Christ. And so with that in mind, we're going to turn things over to Pastor Jimmy Aquino for our invocation and confession and absolution this morning. Let us begin this worship with the invocation. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us now lift our voices to the Lord with a song of praise. Good morning, Hosanna. We're going to sing Made to Worship, and we were made in God's image. We were made to worship him, as the song says. So let's take this time and really give him our worship. Before the day, before the light, before the world revolved around the sun, God on high stepped down into time. And wrote the story of his love for everyone. He has filled our hearts with wonder so that we always remember. Give him your worship, you and I made to worship. You and I are called to love. You and I are forgiven and free. Thank you. 
Happy Reformation Day. Very glad you could be a part of this celebration that we have. Uh, Reformation Day is one of those days where we celebrate the church and all the amazing things God has done for the church and the way he's brought back his eternal word to the church, something we'll see in our first reading from the book of Revelation. But Reformation Day is about the church because it's not about the church. It's about you and me as individuals and the grace we've received. But again, it's because about us because it's not about us, it's about Jesus and the work that Jesus did and what Jesus did to make us righteous and that gift that he gives us then makes us a part of his body, the, the body of Christ, this church. And so we proclaim that gift of grace to individuals who make up the church. And so that's what we're going to see through these readings. Uh, our first reading for today comes from the book of Revelation chapter 14, verses 1 through 7. And what I want you to hear in here is the church. God is delivering a message to the church, and that message is the grace of Christ. So, so this is uh, St. John saying, Then I looked, and there before me was the Lamb, that's Jesus, standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000. That, that number has been explained earlier in the book to be the church, us as the church living in the world, the 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. What, what John's talking about here is your baptism. When God's name was put on you and poured over you in your baptism, it was written on your forehead. And, the, and I heard a sound from heaven like the roar of rushing waters and like a peal of thunder. The sound I heard was like that of harpists playing their harps. And they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. No one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. They followed the lamb wherever he goes. They were purchased from among mankind and offered as first fruits to God and the lamb. No lie was found in their mouths. They are blameless. This is, this is God giving his righteousness to us, the church. And so then John says, Then I saw another angel flying in midair, and he had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. He said in a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our, our next reading comes from the book of Romans, chapter 3, and we're going to focus on verses 19 through 28. And as I'm sure you've heard from me quite a lot over the last few months, I did that, that extensive study through the book of Romans. And, and what I remember so clear, clearly from it is these first two and a half chapters, we, uh, Paul gives us this very, very strong and clear message. And that message is, you are a failure. You can't do anything. No matter how hard you try and no matter how well you live, no matter how much you do, you can never do enough. You can never be enough to earn God's favor. You can't make yourself righteous. You need 
someone else to do that for you. You need Jesus. And that's exactly what Paul says here. He starts with that you are unfit, un incapable of making yourself righteous. Now, we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. We don't have any hope in ourselves trying to work, trying to strive hard enough, trying to be good enough. We don't have a hope at all. But now a righteousness from God, apart from the law, has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God, God predestined Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed before, un, beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Where then is boasting? It is excluded. On what principle? On the observation of the law? No. But on that of faith. For we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And our gospel reading for today comes from the gospel of St. John chapter 8. And there's this, there's this delicious little moment of irony where the people of Israel, the Pharisees, forget their own history conveniently to, to try and poke holes in Jesus' argument. And, and Jesus lets them because... He, he has something more significant that he is worried about. So from John chapter 8. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves to anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? The, the, the delicious irony of this moment is they're forgetting about the whole, their whole time in Egypt as descendants of Abraham, the, the period of the judges where they were conquered time and time again. They're forgetting their present circumstance where they are conquered by Rome and living as a vassal state. And they're saying, we've never been slaves to anyone. And Jesus passes by all of that because he sees the deeper problem that they have, this problem of sin. And so that's what he attacks. And he tells them, you are currently slaves to sin, but I've got an answer to that. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. Everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now, a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Let's now sing a song of praise to our God.
you pl- pray with me for a moment? Gracious Lord God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. Lord, bless the words and the message and make them yours. Let your spirit speak and do not let me be the stumbling block between you and your people. I pray this, Lord, in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen indeed. Well, here we are. It's a Reformation Sunday. It's not really an actual holiday, but the Lutherans sort of act like it is. I mean, Uh, It's a day when we really remember uh, the Reformation era of the church, Martin Luther, other reformers, and things that they have done. And it sort of presents a preaching dilemma. It's kind of like on Christmas and Easter, you know, the the preacher has a certain sort of dilemma in mind because, you know, on Christmas Eve at a candlelight service, what do you think it's going to be about? Everybody shows up knowing it's still about, you know, Luke chapter 2 and the birth of Jesus and so on and the angel and Mary and all that. It's hard to really bring something new year after year after year for everybody. Same thing happens on Easter. I've had people say, you know, uh, 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 every time I come and hear you preach, it's the same thing. Jesus rose from the dead. And I'll say to them, well, how often do you come to preach? Well, they say, every Easter. (laughs) Well, guess what Easter's going to be about? It's about that. Well, Reformation sort of presents a similar sort of problem for preachers because it always seems to come back around to Martin Luther, the Reformation era of the church, and that's not a bad thing. That's, we should take some time and review and think about it. But, but see, here's what I have experienced over the years. I'm guilty of having preached these kinds of messages, and I've also heard other pastors kind of fall into this, where you start to preach these messages that just get a little bit off from the real message of Reformation Day and what this whole thing is really all about. See, that was kind of the problem that Luther had in his day. The church had gotten off track, and he was wanting to get it back on track. Well, sometimes, even over Reformation Day itself, we might find ourselves sort of veering off track sometimes. And so, Here's what I've done. I've got, uh, I've got several sermon outlines for us that we might review. These are the types of things that you might hear on, uh, on a Reformation day. And so uh, let me try some out for you. The first one here, it's called the, uh, uh, the Great In-Depth History Lesson of the Reformation. Sometimes the whole message really becomes kind of a review of history and what happened. That's not a bad thing because people who are ignorant to history are doomed to repeat it. So it's a good thing to review history, but is that really what it's all about? This is the sermon that would go back and kind of review some of the life and times of Martin Luther, a young man who was studying uh, to be a lawyer, and then uh, he got caught up in the midst of a storm, and he cried out to to St. Anne, actually, that he would uh, become a monk if he would be saved. He was saved. He did become a monk. He started to study the the Bible. He already knew Latin, but he learned Greek and Hebrew, and he started to study the Bible, and, and he got further and further into the Bible, and he got more and more concerned because he started to realize that the, the things of the Bible and the things of the church are not really in sync, and he started writing down a list of the things that he knew were out of sync with the Bible, and, and he suddenly realized, you know, he had always been taught that the church was the mediator between God and man, and man you know, so if somebody passes away, how do you know if they went home to heaven? Well, you have to go ask the church. Did grandma make it home? She passed away, great, wonderful, uh, believing woman. Did she make it home to heaven? Well, almost, not quite. And the church, you see, they were selling certain things. They would sell the private mass where you would uh, pay some money and the priest would receive the, consecrate the elements and receive the bread and the wine himself and then somehow grandma gets the credit for it. Or they would sell indulgences. That was really starting to become an issue for Martin Luther as well. And indulgence means, well, last weekend I had kind of a wild weekend, so I pay some money to the church and I get this printed indulgence. It's kind of my get out of hell uh, free card, you know. (laughs) Or you could even buy them in advance pretty soon. You know, I'm anticipating quite a weekend coming up, so I'm going to buy the indulgence ahead of time. You see... Jesus isn't found in that. Martin Luther started becoming more and more uneasy, and he felt, you know, like we're just we're, we're serving power-hungry and greedy popes and people who are extorting money out of others for the sake of salvation, and they're utilizing fear and guilt, and it just really started to drive him mad as he was realizing just how far away from the Bible we had really become, and so he wrote down the list of 95 theses, things that he knew were 
out of sync, and he nails it to the castle church door in Wittenberg, Germany, and he really wanted to start a conversation, but he didn't realize that he was lighting the fuse that would explode into the whole Reformation era of the church. And so uh, it, it, this uh, history lesson kind of goes through what happened with Martin Luther. He, he became more and more persecuted by the church because he was revealing the truth of Scripture instead of, you know, what the Pope was trying to sell at the time. And so he got further and further away from the church. He suffered persecution. Uh, he eventually uh, was whisked away to the Wartburg Castle, and he hid out there. And while he was there, he translated the, the Bible into a sort of a common Germanic language. He ended up marrying a former nun, by the way, Katie uh, Luther. Uh, Catherine von Bora was his, became his wife. She was a former nun, and she had embraced this a theological view of salvation as well, and he got excommunicated, and and eventually he was he was even brought before the a, a trial, if you will, a, a inquisition at a, a, at the Diet of Worms, and he was uh, had his writings laid out there, and they commanded that he recant and take all these things back, and all these writings were really trying to point us to the fact that he had come to understand that we are saved by God's grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone and that it's revealed to us through Scripture alone. You're saved by grace through faith in Christ, not by works so that no one can boast. It's not about money in the coffer or praying a certain number of prayers or doing a certain number of service projects or anything else. It's not about any of that. It's about Jesus Christ alone. Well, they commanded him to recant because people were starting to believe they could just be saved by faith in Jesus and not by the mediation of the church. <laughs> and that's kind of the point. Well, he refused to recant. He stood his ground. He said, you know, unless I'm convinced by Scripture alone, I, I'm bound by conscience. i got to hold true to Scripture. And he finally declared, I cannot recant. I will not recant. Here I stand. God help me. He was whisked away from there, captured, went to the Wartburg, translated the Bible and all the other things. And and so this is the sermon that really just kind of says, know our, our, our uh, Christian uh, uh, heritage, know our Christian history, and what it is that Luther had done for us. Let's have, a or, uh, let's have a history lesson review for the church. Not a bad thing to do. There's certainly a value to it. But to tell you the truth, the history lesson is not really what the central point is of the Reformation is really all about and what Reformation Day is intended to celebrate. But that sermon sometimes spins into this next one. Uh, the next one I kind of like too. It's called Martin Luther, Superhero. It's the one that takes the historical review to a new level and we really start to sort of idolize what Martin Luther had done and how he was such a courageous champion and prolific writer and a genius and deep thinking theologian and and all that he has done for us, which is true, he was a, a great deep thinking sort of theologian, great wisdom and insight. He developed a good articulation of his theological view. Uh, he's one of the most influential people really in, in the history of mankind in a lot of ways. And, and it's great what Martin Luther did, but this is that message that sort of elevates him up to a uh, a pedestal that Martin Luther himself would never want to stand on. Luther was a very humble guy. He would never want to be elevated as some sort of a superhero. In fact, one of the things that Martin Luther said very late in his life is he kind of knew that there's this church movement that's underway. One of the things he said was, no matter what you do, don't call it Lutheran. I don't want my name, Luther was saying, I don't want my name to be the name that's all over all of the churches that's supposed to be about Jesus Christ. So don't call it Lutheran. That was one of the final things he said near the end of his life, and then eventually he died. And, well, <laughs> sorry, Martin, we, uh, we went ahead and called all these churches Lutheran anyway. You see, by that time, the, that uh, name had already come to sort of summarize this theological view that we're saved by God's grace alone, through faith alone, and Jesus Christ alone, revealed to us through Scripture alone. It was just sort of a good summary. So we're not worshiping Luther by putting his name on so many churches and church bodies. Rather, 
we're honoring the work that he did in refocusing us on the gospel. So Martin Luther, superhero, let's not go with that sermon outline. Instead, how about we do this one? I, I've heard this one a number of times. This is the sermon that's called, Why We Need to Be Leery of the Catholics. <laughs> now, certainly in Luther's time, there was a certain rivalry that developed, as you would well imagine. I mean, the Roman Catholic Church had become very corrupt, and they were selling indulgences and the private mass and all kinds of things, and, and it was really kind of money grab and power hungry and all kinds of things. And so Luther left, and they excommunicated him, and sure, there was certainly reason to be leery of one another. But here's what happened. Over the course of time, that suspicion of each other sort of got infused into the into the way in which we are taught and catechized in both churches. And, and it's still sort of prominent in certain places to this very day. I mean, when I was straight into the, the parish, I went. my first parish that I served was Trinity Lutheran Church in Manila, Iowa. Wonderful place, wonderful people. And uh, so you had the church, Lutheran church, and then three houses, and then the Catholic church. So there we were, neighbors on the same street. And when we got to town... I just kind of went down the street and knocked on the door, and I introduced myself to Father Bob Grollop, who was the Catholic priest, been there for a long time. Terrific guy, uh, older guy, really a, just a, a great, gentle spirit, and became a wonderful friend and mentor of mine. We rode motorcycles together and other kinds of stuff. We just became friends, and I didn't realize that I was starting a scandal in town. It sort of became kind of this topic of conversation because, unbeknownst to me, Lutheran pastors who had been in town ahead of me had always kind of tried to infuse a sense of suspicion in the Lutheran people. We got to be leery of those Catholics. So you don't go date those Catholic girls, people were told. And you don't go date those Lutheran boys, people were told. Now, a quick side note, I've met some of them Lutheran boys. That's probably good advice. Don't go date them. <laughs> I'm kidding. Just kidding. But there was sort of this suspicion of each other. we got to be suspicious of each other. And is that really what the Reformation era and what Reformation Day would really be all about? Infusing a suspicion of our brothers and sisters in Christ? No, nah, we're not going to go with that sermon outline either. So, so this one's sort of like the polar opposite of that one then. The other one was, here's why we got to be suspicious of the Catholics. Well, this one is called, here's why we're so high and mighty because we're Lutherans. I've heard this one a few times. This is, this is the kind of sermon that, that elevates us and portrays us as being great champions of pure doctrine. And our job is to make sure that nobody gets in here that's going to somehow pollute or dilute the, the doctrine of of salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. So we're going to stand guard over the doctrine, and, and it sort of makes us Lutherans start to sound like that Pharisee. You remember there's a moment in the gospel when there's a Pharisee who's going to bring his offering to the temple, and he wants to stand up and, and be high and mighty. Look at how I am holier than they. Uh, thank you, Lord, that I am not like that guy. It's kind of how that sermon starts to sound. We Lutherans are sounding awfully arrogant and self-focused. And if we're focused on ourselves, <laughs> we've taken our focus off of what Martin Luther was trying to focus us on, Jesus Christ. So the high and mighty Lutheran sermon, let's pass on that one as well. And this next one I've heard a number of times as well, because you see when pastors sort of struggle their way through Reformation Day preparations over the course of years. You've, you've tried the, uh, the historical review sermon. You tried the Martin Luther superhero sermon. And then you've, you've tried the, uh, here's why we ought to be, you know, leery of the Catholics sermon. Uh, let's try the, uh, here's how come we're whole, all high and mighty Lutherans sermon. Those all kind of leave you wanting. And so, Oftentimes, pastors resort to the, uh, let me baffle you with my brilliance sermon. And so I want to share with you some of the great, deep theological things that I learned at seminary and some of the $2 words that I picked up. And so pretty soon, I'm going to tell you all about the apotelismaticum and the myostaticum and the idiomaticum of the two natures of Christ. And yeah, let me know when this starts to impress you a little bit. <laughs> 
usually those are the sermons that people just sort of tune out of anyway. You're not really going to baffle anybody with your brilliance. It sounds like something else. So you know what? I tell you, let's, let's not go with that one either. And so what are we left with? Well, we're really left with just one more sermon outline that I think really does kind of summarize for us the true message of the Reformation era. This is what the Reformation is really all about right here. You see what's on this page? Nothing. Nothing at all. Because you see, here's something that Martin Luther did figure out as he studied his way through Scripture. Nothing is exactly what we have to offer up to God that would cause him to love us, that would cause him to pour out his mercy and his grace, that would cause him to open up his eternal heavenly home or welcome us into his family. Nothing is exactly what we have to offer to him. And yet, as we bring nothing whatsoever before him, no merit or worthiness in us, as we bring nothing to the table to offer up to God, he gives us everything in Jesus Christ. Everything, the very breath of life in our lungs, the new life that we live by faith in Jesus Christ, that eternal life that we anticipate in that heavenly home, everything has come to us as a gift of God by his own mercy and grace. Luther really discovered this truth when he was studying his way through Romans and other kinds of things. And, and think about this moment here recorded for us in Paul's letter to the Romans, the Christian church in the city of Rome. And he gives us this great teaching. He says, there is no difference for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There's no difference between the Roman Catholics and the Lutherans and all of the other denominations out there. There's no difference between us and the people who don't even know Jesus Christ, there is nothing that makes us any closer to God because we're Lutheran. There is nothing that brings us any closer to God than, than anybody else out there because we all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We have nothing to offer up to Him. But all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Christ, uh, God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. Do you hear in that the summary of Martin Luther's teaching? We are saved by God's grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone. There is no merit or worthiness in us. And this gospel of salvation is revealed to us through Scripture alone. We come with nothing before God. He gives us everything in Christ. Jesus lived and died and rose again for our sake. He lived the perfect life we couldn't live without sin. He died in an atoning sacrifice for our sins to, to wash us clean and make us new. And he rose up victorious over death in the grave so that we might have new life in him. He has given it all to us. And this entire message of salvation through Christ alone, that is the gospel. And here was John whisked up in this heavenly vision in the book of Revelation. And in Revelation 14, he says, I saw another angel flying in midair and he had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people, he said in a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens and the earth, the sea and the springs of water. Worship the one who has set us free. Worship the one who has redeemed our very souls. Worship the one who has welcomed us into his family. Worship the one, one who has promised that he will go and prepare a place for us and come so that he might receive us home to himself. We worship Christ alone. We focus our lives around Christ alone because we are saved by God's grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone alone. 
And that eternal gospel comes to us through Scripture alone. We brought nothing to God. We're blank pages. I got nothing to give you. But he gave us everything. And now that we possess everything, the gospel of Jesus Christ, that's the gospel to proclaim to all those who live on the earth, every nation, tribe, language, and people. That's the mission of the church today. Focus on Christ. Proclaim Christ. Be the hands and the voice and the arms and the comfort of Christ to the people around you. Because while we come to him with nothing, he gives us everything. And so, to him be the glory today and forever. In Jesus' holy name, amen. May the peace of God which surpasses all of our understanding keep our hearts and minds in one true faith in Christ Jesus our Lord until that day when he receives us home. Amen. I want to ask you to pray with me for a moment. We pray for all the people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. In the prayers of the church today especially, we ask God to keep us focused on the one true gospel. We pray for our preschool, that it will continue to grow in its enrollment, that God will give us every opportunity to, uh, to share the good news with those children. We pray for our nation. It finds itself in a very tumultuous place, in a, uh, uh, in a very difficult election cycle. And we ask God to bring peace and healing and wisdom and guidance, bring unity to our land. And finally, we pray for a young woman named Tia. Tia is a young mom struggling, trying to work and make ends meet for her, her family, and she's also supporting not only her own children, but also her grandparents. We ask God to provide for her needs, to work through us to help do that and to give her peace and joy in the way she serves her family as service to Christ. Let's pray. Gracious Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that you have blessed us with this day and the opportunity to gather even by these means here so that we might know that we are the body of Christ together, your holy Christian church that we call Hosanna. Lord, we pray keep us focused on the true gospel, the the good news of Christ our Savior, the sacrifice and the forgiveness and the new life that Jesus won for us and the way he has poured out all things, every good and gracious gift that comes down from heaven from your hand. Lord, bless us that we might focus our lives on Jesus and that we might preach and teach and reach out into the community around us with this good news in the saving name of Christ. O oh Lord, in your mercy... Hear our prayer. Lord of the church, we give you thanks for the way you are at work in so many ways in and through the people of Hosanna and, and the way you've blessed us through the ministry of Little Palms Preschool. And we ask you to continue to uh, fill up our classrooms. Lord, bring children to us and their families so that we might have every opportunity to uh, proclaim the good news of Jesus, share that good news with those developing hearts and souls and, and, and with their families as well. And as as you fill up our classroom, Lord, let us rejoice in all that you do in and through your church and your people and in and through the gospel itself, shaping lives in Christ. O oh, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord of the nations, we find our own nation to be in a time of turmoil and uh, division as we continue on through this election cycle. And we ask you, Lord, to bring healing and peace and a sense of unity for our land. Raise up leaders that will, uh, that will lead your people in ways that are good and right in your sight. We pray, Lord, uh, lead them so that they might lead us in ways that allow us to lead peaceful and godly lives to your great glory. And where there is so much division in families and among friends, bring healing, bring peace, bring a renewed focus on the joy of this great land that you've blessed us to live in. O Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord of the church, you create opportunities for us to serve those who are in need as the hands of Jesus, the voice of Jesus in so many ways. And we've discovered this young woman, Tia, and we seek to help her. We thank you, Lord, for the great generosity that so many have poured out already for her sake and to help her with groceries and other kinds of things. We ask you, Lord, to continue to bless and guide us so that we might serve her and open our eyes to other people around us who also find themselves to be in 
any kind of need so that we might help to uh, provide for them and guide them into the love and the mercy and the grace of Christ our Savior. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your great mercy and grace as you made it known to us through Jesus our Savior, who makes us your own and who taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. and Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the power and the kingdom and the glory, today and forever, in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen indeed. And now let's lift our voices as we sing another song of praise for Christ. Once again, thanks for joining us in our worship this Sunday, a very uh, special worship. is uh, our celebration of the Reformation. And so as you go, I, I wish you a very happy Reformation Sunday. And as we go, receive the benediction of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And the Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. Amen. And once again, thanks for joining us in our worship this Sunday. And as always, go in God's peace.
for we are his children. Amen. Amen.